Hi everybody, so I'm Christopher Lovejoy, I'm a medical doctor turned AI engineer, and I'm gonna share a playbook for building a domain native LLM application. Uh, so I spent about eight years um, training and working as a medical doctor, and then I spent the last seven years building AI systems that incorporate medical domain expertise. Um, and I did that at a few different startups. So I worked at a, a health tech startup called Sarah Care, um, doing tech-enabled home care. Uh, the startup recently hit 500 million ARR. Um, worked at various other startups, and I currently work at Anterior. And Anterior is a New York-based clinician-led uh, company. We provide clinical reasoning tools to automate and accelerate uh, health insurance um, and healthcare administration. Uh, we serve about 50 million. Uh, we serve uh, health insurance providers that cover about 50 million lives uh, in the U.S. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to build a domain-native LLM application, whether it's in healthcare um, or otherwise. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And in particular, our bet really is that when it comes to vertical AI applications, the system that you build for incorporating your domain insights is far more important than the sophistication of your models and your pipelines. So the limitation these days is not like how powerful is your model and whether it can uh, reason to the level that you need it to. It's more, can your model understand the context um, in that industry for that particular customer uh, and perform, perform the reasoning that it needs to? And the way that you enable that and the way that you uh, kind of iterate quickly with your customers is by building this system around it. And there's various components to that. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So this is the kind of a high-level schematic, and we're going to go through each of these parts um, throughout the talk. Uh, as you'll see, right in the middle, there's the, the PM. Um, and this is, you know, in our experience, it makes sense for this to be a domain um, expert um, product manager. So in our context, it's clinical. Um, and I'm going to go through, go through this in more detail shortly. But first, I think it's worth taking a quick step back and asking, you know, why is it so hard to successfully apply large language models to specialized industries? We think it's because of the last mile problem. And what I mean by the last mile problem is, is this problem that I, I kind of touched on just now around uh, giving the model and your, your kind of AI system more generally context and understanding of the specific workflow for that customer, for that industry. Um, and I'm going to illustrate that with an example um, from a clinical case that we've processed. Our AI anterior is called Florence. And a 78-year-old female patient uh, presented with right knee pain. The doctor recommended a knee arthroscopy. And as part of deciding whether this treatment was appropriate, whether the doctor made a, an appropriate decision, Florence needs to answer various questions. Uh, one of those questions is, is there documentation of unsuccessful conservative therapy for at least six weeks? Um, and you know, on the surface of it, that might seem relatively simple. I mean, I appreciate maybe not a lot of doctors in the room, so you might not know necessarily what conservative therapy is. But... Um, Actually, there's a lot of kind of like hidden complexity in answering a question like this. So, for example, you know, conservative therapy, um, typically what we mean by conservative therapy is when there's some kind of option for, uh, you know, a more aggressive treatment, maybe a surgical operation. That's like the, the, you know, the surgical treatment. And then if you're deciding not to operate and you want to try something conservative first, that's like the conservative therapy. So it might be, you know, do physiotherapy, uh, lose weight, um, do kind of you know, non-invasive things that might uh, help resolve the problem. But actually, there's, some, there's still some ambiguity there because, uh, you know, in some cases, giving medication might be a conservative therapy. In some cases, that's actually the more aggressive treatment and there's something else that's more conservative. Um, so there's one layer of ambiguity there. Then when we talk about unsuccessful, um, well, what is unsuccessful? Let's say that somebody has uh, some knee pain, they do some treatment and their symptoms improve significantly, but they don't like fully resolve. So is that successful? Do we need like a full resolution of symptoms? Or is it just like a partial resolution is enough? If it's partial, like at what point is that enough to be quantified as successful? Um, so again, there's kind of complexity and nuance with, with how that's interpreted. And then finally, documentation for at least six weeks. Again, you know, documentation, are we saying that the medical record said they started physical therapy eight weeks ago, then it's never mentioned again? We can therefore assume that they've been done it for, for eight weeks? Uh, or do we need like explicit documentation that they started treatment, they did it for eight weeks, and you know it, it, it's completed? Uh, where, where do where do we kind of like draw the line there in terms of what we can infer? Um, and yeah, just kind of coming coming back to echo our point. So this is really our bet that the system is more important 
Uh, we believe that in every vertical industry, the, uh, you know, the team, the company that wins, is the one that builds the best system for taking those domain insights and quickly translating them into the pipeline, giving it that context and, and iterating um, to create this improvement. Um, and we also, uh, you know, found, I guess to talk to this counterpoint, the models, I mean, models obviously are important, um, and the, the progress in models makes it easier to have a good starting point, but that's only getting you up to a certain baseline. And we found we kind of hit a saturation around the, like 95% uh, level. So we invested a lot of time and effort in improving our pipelines. Um, obviously, 95% is still pretty reasonable. And this is that performing the like, primary task that our, our AI system does, which is approving these care requests um, in a health insurance context. Um, so we're at 95%. And we then iterated based on this system um, that I'm going to walk through. And we really got to you know, a kind of almost silly accuracy of like 99%. Uh, we've got this class point of um, light award a few weeks ago for this. Um, and really what we found here and what we observed is that the, the models reason very well. They get to a great baseline. But if you're in, in an industry where you really need to eke out that like, final mile of performance, um, you need to be able to then kind of give the model, give the pipeline that, that context. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, we call this our adaptive domain intelligence engine. And what this is performing is it's taking customer-specific domain insights and it's converting them into performance improvements um, and kind of building a system around that. And there's broadly two main parts to this. The first part is the measurement side of things. So you know, how, is, how is our current pipeline doing? Um, and then the rest of this is the uh, improvement side. So I'm going to talk first a bit more about measurement in, in more detail and then, and then a bit about improvements. So measuring domain-specific uh, performance. The first thing, um, and I think you know, a lot of this is, is really just kind of best practice, best practice more generally, but um, the first step is to define what is it that your users really care about as metrics. So in a health context, obviously I've been talking about medical necessity reviews. Um, this is our bread and butter. And there, the customers really care about false approvals. They want to minimize false approvals because a false approval where you've approved care means that you know, a patient who didn't need the care might get given some care they don't need. And obviously, from an insurance provider point of view, they're then paying for treatment that they don't necessarily want to pay for. Um, and often, defining these metrics is like a collaboration between the domain experts in your company and the customers to kind of like really translate what are the metrics that you care about. They might be like one or two, or like usually there's just a few metrics that matter most. So in a few other industries, like legal, when you're analyzing contracts, it might be that you really want to minimize the number of uh, missed critical terms when you're, when you're identifying these clauses in the contract. For fraud detection, your top line metric might be something like preventing um, dollar loss from fraud. You know, education, it might be you want to optimize for test score improvements. Um, I think it's, it's a definitely a helpful exercise to push yourself to think of like, really, if I'm optimizing for like one or two metrics, what is like the metric that is most important? Um, and then what you can also do hand in hand with that, um, which is very helpful, uh, I'm just going off the bottom there a little bit, but uh, is designing a failure mode ontology. And what I mean by this is taking the task that you're performing and identifying what are all the different ways in which my AI fails. And it might be at the level of like higher order categories. So for example, here we've got medical record extraction, clinical reasoning, and rules interpretation. We found that for medical necessity review, these are the three broad categories, the three broad ways in which the AI can fail. And then within those, there's various like different subtypes. Um, and this is an iterative process. There's like various techniques for doing this. Um, I think it it's important here to bring in your domain experts. I think one failure mode is that you have somebody kind of looking at your AI traces in isolation and coming up with these um, who don't necessarily have the context on how things are, are working. I think this is a, a step where it's critical to have domain experts uh, leading this process. Um, but really, I think the, the big value add is when you do both of these at the same time um, together. Because what this gives you, uh, and, and this, is a, this is a dashboard that we've built internally. I appreciate the text might be a little bit small. Um, but essentially, on the right-hand side, you have a patient's medical record. You also have the guidelines that are, the record is being appraised against. On the left-hand side, you have the AI outputs. Um, so this is the decision that it's made, the reasoning behind its decision. And what we enable our domain experts to do here, enable our clinicians, is they can come in. They can mark whether it's correct or incorrect. And if it's incorrect, then this box here is for um, defining the failure mode. So from that ontology we just saw on the slide before, they can say, this failed in this way. And Doing those at the same point and having your domain expert sit at that point doing both of these is uh, super valuable because it then enables you to understand things like this. So on the x-axis here, we have 
number of false approvals. That's the metric that we really care about in our context. And then we have the different failure modes on, on the uh, y-axis. And obviously, that tells us that if we want to minimize our false approvals and we want to like, optimize for this, this top north star, north star metric that we care about, these are what we want to address first, like kind of in this order, um, which as a PM is then a useful piece of information to help you prioritize uh, the work that you want to do. So that's the measure side of things. I'm now going to go on to talk about the, um, the improvements, um, and particularly with this domain-specific context. So what that also gives you, this kind of failure mode labeling we talked about before, is you get these ready-made data sets that you can iterate against. And these data sets are super valuable because they're coming directly from production data, which means you know that they're representative of the kind of input data distribution that you're going to see, more so than synthetic data would be. Uh, and you can now, you know, when you, you had those priorities on the previous slide, we saw which sort of failure modes were causing the most false approvals. We can then pick that data set of, you know, 100 cases that came through prod in the last week that had this particular failure mode. You can give that to an engineer, an engineer can iterate against it, and you can keep on testing, okay, how is my performance against that particular failure mode right now? And that lets you do something like this, where on the x-axis here, we have the pipeline version. On the y-axis, we have the performance score. Um, by definition, on these floors, we're starting very low for each of these like failure mode data sets. But every time you increment your pipeline version, you, maybe you spent some time focusing on this particular failure mode, and, and you were able to get a big jump in performance. Um, and then you can see the other ones also jumping up as well um, on kind of subsequent releases. And you can also use this to then track that you're not regressing on any particular failure mode as well. Um, so it's a useful, useful uh, visualization to be able to make. And you can then go one step further and actually bring your domain experts into the kind of improvements and the iteration itself. And what that looks like is creating this tooling that enables a domain expert who's not necessarily technical to come in. They can then suggest changes to the application pipeline. They can also suggest new domain knowledge that's made available to the pipeline. And obviously, they're the best positioned to be making these kind of um, you know, opinions of what sort of domain knowledge might be, might be relevant. And then you have your pipeline in the middle that's ready to use those if it wants to. And then on the right-hand side, you have those domain evals, which might be these failure set evals. You might have more generic eval sets as well. And they can then tell you in a data-driven way, OK, given this domain knowledge suggestion from a domain expert, should that go live in the platform? And now it's in production, and, and then um, you know, it should be improving the performance for, for live customers. Um, and this whole loop can happen very quickly. So for example, and I think actually on the next slide, yeah, I'll just show. Um, so this is the dashboard we saw before, but this is with this extra button, which is like a domain knowledge edition button. And so again, we're keeping the same context. We have uh, you know, a domain expert, a clinician coming in here. They're reviewing the case. They're saying, is it correct? Is it incorrect? They're saying, what's the failure mode? And now they can say, I think this domain knowledge would be helpful for the application's performance. And uh, you know, it might be, I think in this case, I appreciate it might not be that easy to read, but um, the model's kind of making some, some mistake related to understanding suspicion of a condition because the patient like has the condition and it says, oh, there's no suspicion of the condition, um, but actually they, they have it. And like, there's, there's some, like you could give some information to the model for the medical context of how we interpret suspicious or suspicion as a word that would then influence the answer. Um, or it could be that maybe the reasoning uh, uses some kind of scoring system and you realize actually the model doesn't have access to that scoring system. You could, again, you could add that as domain knowledge um, to continually build out what the, what the model can handle. And what that helps with, yeah, in, term, in terms of kind of the iteration speed from that, you can do that. Maybe you want to let your evals automatically let that go in, or maybe you want to um, have some kind of human in the loop. But it just means that you can have this very quick process. This prod case comes through. You analyze it you, um, by a, a, through a clinical lens. And then the same day, you've essentially fixed it because you've added the domain knowledge that should solve it. You can prove that with the evals, and then it's live. And what this means is that you know, these domain expert reviews that are really kind of powering a lot of the insights you're getting here are giving you three main things. They're giving you performance metrics, they're giving you these failure modes, and they're giving you these suggested improvements um, all in one. Yep. Yeah, good question. So the question is, um, how do you define a domain expert? Like, what level of, of expertise do you need here? I think it really depends on the specific, like, workflow that you're doing um, and what you're kind of optimizing for. So in our context, if you're optimizing for clinical reasoning and the quality of the clinical reasoning, you therefore want somebody with like, as much clinical experience, ideally a doctor. Um, you know, ideally, they have relevant expertise in a speciality that you're dealing with. 
Uh, but it, but it kind of really depends on your use case. It might be that there's actually simpler things we also um, can, can do, in which case that level of expertise is not necessary, and you could have you know, like a more junior clinical person. But the, the idea being that you know, it's either like a nurse or a doctor or, or somebody that has experience of doing this workflow in, in the real world. Does that make sense? Yeah, another question? Yeah, this is, this is bespoke tooling. And I think in general, my, my philosophy on this is that if you're, if you're really placing a lot of weight on what you're kind of generating and this feeds into your system in various other different ways in the kind of ways I'm describing, it probably makes most sense to do this with bespoke tooling that you build yourself because it's, you want to integrate it into the rest of your platform and it, it's just generally going to be um, you know, easier to do that if you're, if you're kind of like doing everything yourself. Yeah, great question. Um, I think it can, it can be both. Um, we, like in our experience, typically we start with, we, we will hire some people in-house who will kind of come and do this for us to give us this initial data so that we can do that iteration. I think there's definitely a world in which the customer themselves might also want to do validation of your AI and they might actually do this kind of process themselves, in which case this then becomes a customer facing product for them to, to use as well. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so. I Love the questions, but we're going to reserve time for Chris yeah, to keep going. Yeah, sounds good. And, and I'm just, um, this is the last couple of slides now as well. So putting everything together, uh, this is the overall flow. And essentially what this, what, what this can look like is you, know, you have your production application. It's generating these decisions, these AI outputs. You're having your domain experts review that, giving these performance insights. That's things like the metrics, the failure modes. Uh, you then have your PM, your kind of domain expert PM who sits in the middle. They then have this rich information on, okay, what should I prioritize based on the failure modes, based on the metrics? They can then turn to an engineer and say, um, I want you to fix this failure mode because I really care about it, and I want you to fix it up to this performance threshold. So they can say, right now, you know, in production, we're getting 0% or 10% on this particular data set. I want you to go away and work on this until you get to 50%. And then the engineer can go and um, you know, run different experiments, have different ideas of how they might improve this, changing prompting, changing models, doing fine tuning, all this kind of thing. They then have a very tight iteration loop because they have these ready-made failure mode data sets. They can run the eval. They can see the impact of those um, evals. And then once they've kind of done that loop and they're, they're hitting the percentage that they need, they can then go and give that back to the, the PM and say, hey, here are the changes I made. This is the impact. The PM can then um, take that information and make some decision about going live. They can take the, those uh, eval metrics. They can look at the kind of wider context of what this change might impact elsewhere in the product, um, and then decide whether to go live uh, with that in production. So final takeaways, just to wrap up. Um, you know, to build a domain native LM application, you need to solve the, the last mile problem. This isn't solved by just using more powerful models or more sophisticated pipelines. Uh, you need what we call an adaptive domain intelligence engine. Domain experts can power this system by reviewing the AI outputs to generate metrics, to generate failure modes, and to generate suggested improvements. And this is really powerful because it takes production data live from kind of inside your customer's context, and it uses that to give your LLM product the nuanced understanding of the customer workflows and continually iterate towards that and eke out the, the kind of final performance, um, performance level. And the end result is you have this self-improving data-driven process that can be managed by a domain expert PM sitting in the middle. Um, so thank you for your attention. Um, uh, I, if you're interested in kind of vertical AI applications or like evals and AI product management more generally, I've written about that um, at my website, chrislovejoy.me. Uh, always interested to talk about this, so feel free to drop an email at chris.anterior.com. And we're also hiring as well at the moment, so check out anterior.com forward slash company for open roles. Thank you. Thank you.